Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Hal Dietz. As immediate past president of ASHG, it is my privilege to introduce this year's president, Nancy Cox. At her request, I will keep these remarks quite brief. As you all know, Nancy's scientific contributions to our field have been extremely diverse and impactful. What you may not know is that her record of contribution and service to our society dates back nearly 40 years and has been e equally illustrious. Her tenure as president has been distinguished by both innovation and accomplishment. Through my many years of interaction and friendship with Nancy, I have admired her clarity of thought, depth of passion, and provocative speaking style. I bet we are in, a, we are in for a treat today. Please join me in welcoming Nancy for her presidential address entitled Checking, Balancing, and Celebrating Genetic Diversity. Nancy. So yes, he said 40 years. When I first wrote it down, I said 20 years, but no, it's 40 years. So, and. I have to say, part of the reason that I'm here is a presidential address, I think in 2001, maybe from um, Hunt Willard, who said, if you're tired of seeing old white men leading your society, come to the business meeting, get on a committee, do some work, make it your society. And that, that's really an important part of my message today. If you take ownership of this society and make it what you want it to be, it will be the best society it can be. So I also want to yeah, start with, the, um, with my message on check, checking, balancing, and celebrating genetic diversity by thanking first um, outgoing board members, let's see, uh, and our past president, Hal Dietz. Um, and you're probably not aware that many of our board members spend many more years in service than just the three years on a, on a particular time when they're on the board. I want to thank our incoming board members as well, whose term begins in 2018. I want to thank also um, our new editor. So. Um, Bruce Korf is going to be a fantastic editor for the American Journal, our flagship enterprise. And David um, Nelson, whose service we really have to thank. He's been um, doing board duty now for many years and will be our incoming president in 2018. And I especially want to thank Peter Scaccheri and the entire program committee. This is just a, a fantastic program that they have set up for us. And I'm really looking forward to the rest of the meeting, as you might imagine. We also have some transitions in leadership of the ASHG that I wanted to draw everybody's attention to. Look for Mona Miller um, and the meetings, our new executive director who comes to us from the Society for Neuroscience with a lot of uh, great ideas, fresh energy, and some fresh eyes to really look at our society in new ways. And I especially want to congratulate uh, Joe McInerney, our, our past um, executive vice president, for his service, long service to our society, and for really helping lead us into a more strategic, uh, more strategic thinking as a board. Um, he, it was Joe's idea that president-elects would go to president school. There's actually a two-day school where you learn how to be the president of a society. And it's just a, it's really a good experience. I recommend it to all first-term presidents, especially if you haven't had relevant experience. Um, and uh, on that note, I also want to say that while I am pleased to be able to meet the need for accommodation of one of our scientists who was unable to travel to the meeting because of uh, the travel uh, ban. Uh, and his presentation will be permitted to, we will be able to do that with Zoom. It's important for all of us to remember that this is not the optimal way that we would prefer to be able to do science. And his absence is really a loss for all of us. 
And so I, I want to sort of check in now on our progress in the assay of genome variation across diverse populations. And I think there really is some progress that we can celebrate. Uh, the first group that I want to call out as the Genome Sequencing Project, and especially the emphasis now in the Centers for Common Disease Genomics in getting a lot more uh, U.S. of the U.S. population into the whole genome sequencing efforts. And um, this is a, a, a major emphasis in the projects now, and I think overdue, but really, really highly valued. I would have to recognize, you might see my name there on that slide, and self-promotion was actually not one of the uh, topics covered in President's School, but I have it on high authority that that is a modern, a way that modern presidents um, are working these days. And I think especially in service to such important scientific goals as inclusion and diversity um, in whole genome sequencing, I think it's, it's really useful to call it out. This also reminds me to give a special thanks to all NIH program officers, those visionary people who learn to blend the vision that scientists bring in, uh, on their own into these big projects with the strategic planning that NIH has done around these projects. This is Adam Felsenfeld, who is, for the genomic sequencing project, a really a master of herding cats. They must have a cat herding school that the NIH people learn to go to to learn cat herding in this context but to all of our NIH program officers that have to work on these big projects and herd all of the cats and spend half of their life on conference calls. Thank you all for your, your service in what I think are really important activities. I also want to give a shout out to TopMed. The, this program is not only bringing in whole genome sequencing to large numbers of uh, U.S of the U.S. population who've been largely underserved in previous genomic studies, but also other omics. And being able to see other omics at scale in populations where we haven't enjoyed um, the ability to get those studies done in the past is so important. And I really think the, the top med activities are a fantastic addition to what needs to be done. Part of how all of this new data is getting into everybody's studies um, are the imputation servers that people have spent a lot of time and effort to build. And I think th that's also a, an important activity. It's not just the collection of all of that new omics data, but ways to get that data into everybody's studies. I think the imputation servers at the University of Michigan, at the Sanger Center, are really contributing to our ability to do genetics at scale in diverse populations and get better take-home information for discovery research. I want to give a special mention to H3Africa because it's not just important to get more genetic information from world populations. But it's also important, and, and H3Africa has been doing this superbly, building the pipelines to bring scientists in Afri Africa together with scientists from around the world who are interested in the research that can um, work so profitably on a two-way street um, for these interactions. H3Africa has really done that superbly, and I think um, it's a model for a lot of the kinds of research that I think we want to support um, strongly going forward. I also want to give a shout out to my colleagues in Mexico who developed a really selective, high quality undergraduate program for genomic sciences that emphasized education in biology, education in statistics and mathematics, and education in computer science all equally in the undergraduate education. And the young people who have graduated from that program are now doing PhDs and postdoctoral research in some of the best labs all across the world. 
And to really cap off that investment, um, they've developed a new institute for human genome research there that now brings back some of these young people as faculty to really see the next generation, new generations of scientists there. And I think it is, as they call it, a magnet for talent. It really is, um, and it's, it's a terrific program that I think is also the kind of a model for uh, education of scientists going forward. And I, there's not time to, to describe all of the work that's being done. Certainly colleagues at the Wellcome Trust and Sanger Institute um, lead things. There are programs, a number of important programs like this um, in Asia. But I think it, it reminds us that it's not enough to collect data on all of the world's populations, but we talk about diversity in science, we mean the whole package. More scientists engage at all levels, and I think these are things that we can work forward with. I want to give a special shout out to the PAGE Consortium, though. This is a group of extreme, and, and that's only a small part of them, a group of extremely dedicated investigators who have toiled long and hard to bring genetic information at scale to populations that have been underserved. Um, so, so, and so this is a group that's had to work very hard, um, been underfunded the whole time, and it's really their persistence and dedication that has allowed now great new discoveries to be identified and characterized and brought forward um, because of their persistence. So I think there is a lot of reason to celebrate uh, the improvement in the, our ability to interrogate uh, genetic, genetically diverse human populations. But on the balancing end, compared with what we need, what we've done so far is really just a drop in the bucket. I think it's critical that we remember why it's so important to do this. There's so many things that we still don't know and understand about how human populations have evolved and the things that we can learn and take forward for our understanding of health and disease are really fantastic if we can continue to, to build on what progress there's been. I want to highlight the work of a, a young student who did kind of a really cool science hat trick, um, worked with a, an evolutionary and computational population genetics group first as a graduate student to identify signatures of natural selection through the human genome, um, in fact, shared between humans and chimpanzees, and then in postdoctoral research with another group was able to follow up on one of those um, signatures of natural, of balancing selection, to actually get to the molecular basis for that adaptation. It, it's a great story that only happens when we have data at scale for, um, for the world's populations. And of course, it's not just Africa, but adaptations um, locally are, are key. And it's not just about the curiosities like balancing selection, of course, that, that are part of the very definition of our field from the beginning. But I think for true, for our understanding of modern human health and disease, the APOL1 story has just been a tremendous lesson. With APOL1, there's genetic variation that in populations in which trypanosome infections are endemic um, reduces the risk of infection with uh, of the trypanosome infections but is also increasing risk for kidney failure um, and and end-stage renal disease a, a set of phenotypes as it were kidney disease kidney failure end-stage renal disease that we otherwise were thinking had the classic polygenic architecture, a disease of Western diet and lifestyle, as it were, and yet learning about the way that APOL1 variation affects risk of kidney disease really should put us on guard that there are going to be many more examples like this where what we can learn by studying diverse populations is going to help us understand some of the 
checks and balances that we are still dealing with, the way past adaptations to high pathogen environments are still impacting our risk of health and disease. Um, we're going to continue to see this, uh, lots of, of papers around these ideas that again require that we have the ability to look at all of the world's population. I think some of the recent research from Sarah Tishkoff and her colleagues on the, these loci associated with skin pigmentation, also a terrific example of how real data in populations across Africa that be, can be compared with the rest of the world's data is completely changing our narrative, our understanding of how this variation works to affect the phenotypes that we're interested in and also impact um, the adaptations we make to local environment. And of course, again, I have to recognize Sarah is a member of the Board of Directors for the American Society, and she is also my academic sister, as it were. We had the same academic advisor. And again, I acknowledge that nepotism was not on our curriculum at President's School, but it is the modern way, and I do also want to recognize that, you know, your family really can be doing great work. And in this case, it is totally worth a shout out to um, Sarah and her group on this research. I also want to remind everybody that there, there's research, related research, on the fact, as we would all recognize, that coding variation it's not arising in a vacuum. Even the coding variation that we know affects both protein function and the ability of an organism to truly function in a healthy way, that variation does not arise in a vacuum. It arises on some context related to the local regulation. And Tuli Lapalainen and postdoc Stefan Kastel have done some fantastic work characterizing that relationship and showing that the potential adaptation um, is going to exist beyond the coding sequence into joint relationships with regulatory variation that we can now identify and begin to understand and think about being able to use in a whole variety of ways to come back again to things like um, important genetic con concepts such as penetrance. So this is also a reminder to me to give a shout out to GTEx, my probably favorite all-time project um, to date. Uh, the version six papers from the entire group are out, and that's only a small amount of self-promotion. You should think of that as mostly promoting my, my uh, trainees and colleagues um, who have worked so diligently on GTEx. It has been a crazy year, though. Um, it's been a crazy year in many ways. We had two search committees going. We had um, many kinds of activities at ASHG that um, were concluded very successfully, especially HR 1313 so far. But I also, because of the sort of external craziness, I do want to welcome to our society um, any refugees, Silicon Valley refugees, um, who find their current intellectual home not as welcoming as they would like. We do data science here. We have the need for all kinds of additional computation scientists. And so, I, and I've got a whole set of mentors lined up. Anybody who's um, in Silicon Valley and not feeling that they have the kind of welcoming intellectual home should really come here to ASHG. And I do want to also give a shout out to a data science session um, at the end of the coming plenary session uh, that should illustrate our commitment. I'm going to close now by um, focusing a little bit on the way things used to be and the way things are going. Um, in a series of slides prepared by Digna Velez Edwards and Todd Edwards at Vanderbilt. They've documented sort of the pattern of diversity by decade of birth. 
um, in our bio in the samples from our biobank um, BioView, and um, Nashville was not such a diverse place in uh, the years from 1905 to 1920. Um, but going forward through time, even the next decade, you can see more diversity there. I'm giving some context to this by highlighting papers from women scientists who've worked in genetics over these periods. Um, we see in the next decade even more diversity. We finally have actually a reasonable size Asian community uh, coming in. And as we go into the next decade, um, you can see now we're finally getting past Barbara McClintock's contributions and we have some contributions from Rosalind Franklin to highlight. We continue to get more diverse and, um, and I highlighted with the stars a paper that um, is my, on my own personal all-time list for best paper title. And if, for those of you who didn't know Pat Jacobs, who is a former William Allen Award winner from ASHG, I can assure you that that title was chosen in part to ensure that we'd still be talking about it um, all this time later. As we go on becoming more diverse in Nashville, there's some of the contributions I want to highlight from quantitative scientists uh, who really developed the next generation of human quantitative genetics. Jean McClure is somebody that um, was instrumental at the start of many of the careers of women in quantitative sciences, um, and Anne Spence as well. Um, Uta Franca, a personal mentor of mine from the time I did uh, research in her lab as a graduate student doing a rotation. And finally, we're getting into more modern eras. Uh, we have some increased diversity, um, but especially here um, in the 1990s, you start to see what's happening sort of all over with the lines from the triangle starting to fill in. And um, our, some of the early work from our so far only female Kurt Stern Award winner, Vivian Chung. It's easy to see now with this last slide um, where we're headed. And frankly, there is no going back on this part of the diversity equation either. Uh, I've ended the, the series of papers with the classic one from uh, Josephine Ho and colleagues, which was the first uh, published GWAS at scale over the whole genome. And, and I'm going to project out a little bit. If we were to go from 2013 into the next decade on what we might expect it to look like, and from my field in human quantitative genetics, um, some of the people that I would expect to be the rising stars. And while I have always admired the um, canonical image that John Novembre and colleagues put forward when they showed how the map of Europe could be reproduced in this sort of PC1 by PC2 space that we're familiar with looking at now in genetics. I am, and all they had to do was a little rotation of axes and, and use of color. But I'm actually much more interested in um, what we might be able to do in the United States by becoming the first country to be able to fill in that really golden triangle and to move, move into an era where people can use whatever parts of their past culture and current culture they feel is useful for them and no longer have to feel the need to identify exclusively with the part of the world where their most recent ancestors acquired the small number of adaptations and random variation that differentiates them from the rest of uh, humanity. I'm also looking forward to the time when I don't have to highlight the contributions of women scientists because the contributions of women scientists in human genetics will be as valued and acknowledged as the contributions from uh, male scientists in human genetics. But until that time, I do want to remind people of uh, the history of, of women with Nobel laureates in, uh, in genetics-related fields and those who were enablers of Nobel Prizes related to genetics. 
are five women uh, Allen Award winners, are one Kurt Stern Award winner, women who um, developed the intellectual home in which I live uh, that, that uh, helped develop the human quantitative genetics field, and iconic women who were leaders, leaders of departments, leaders of societies, who really helped create the environment for science that we live in today. I think of all of these women as a mighty protein machine that opens up that chromatin for the rest of us so that we have the ability now to look to the next generation and be confident that we're looking at about half of the potential future award winners of, for the William Allen Award, the Kurt Stern Award, um, the new, uh, new Investigator Awards. You'll notice that when I was talking about the future, I didn't call out my own trainees as stars of the future. And I've really internalized the lesson that if you want people to pay attention, you just tweet it. But we also listen to the public who say you should wait till after your president to really do the tweet storm thing. So my term ends in January. You can expect full tweet storms around mm, Barbara Stranger's contributions to context and EQTLs and Hockey Zim statistical genetics. But mostly, I really want to highlight um, the young people that I meet all over, and it's just they just get younger every year. Thank you all, and it's been it's really been my honor to serve the society. Thanks.